We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Understand that they are that way because you're Joe Flacco. And you just like to discredit things that people deserve credit for. That you can't possibly be expected to defend that. Talk about the game, Sam. So Who cares about what people think about us. Yeah, I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. We apologize to our YouTube viewers. Mm. 30 minutes late here on Wednesday. It's not Austin Gale's fault. It's not his fault at all. Really? That's yeah, pretty much his fault. Yeah, okay. it's all his fault. So we're going to blame Austin. So uh, don't go watch the tailgate as punishment. <laughs> this week. Just this Just week. Just this week. Yeah, yeah. yeah, later you can watch it. But uh, it's because they're working on our big special project. But, uh, but we're here and we're live and we're breaking down all sorts of fun stuff here. And, and news. You, what did you just read to me before we went live? Uh, Jesse Bates. That, no, that no, 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 not the Jesse Bates thing. Jesse Bates tweeted eyeball emojis, and I'm just not, I can't deal with that. I'm that's not, big. No. Stop. That's also, that's my move. That's my move during free agency. <laughs> it gets the people riled up. I can't handle it. I'm a couple weeks away from, a, uh, from, a, I'm not, from some good eyeball emoji tweets. I'm just not analyzing eyeball emoji tweets. So the other thing you read to me. I don't remember. Tom Brady. Oh, Tom Brady starting in a comedy. What? 80 for Brady. Is what it's going to be called. Excuse me? 80 for Brady. Where's Eight the, uh, as in the number. Yeah. Ho- Eight ho- zero. Credit the Hollywood Reporter. In his first post-retirement move, Tom Brady will produce and star. Produce and star. <laughs> in a new road trip movie titled 80 for Brady. This is going to be so bad he's back in the NFL next year. It wrote. It, what is Hashtag so 80 for Brady. The film will also feature Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda, Rita Moreno, and Sally Field. That, that sounds like the worst idea that anybody in the history of the world has ever had. It's a new new road trip movie. A road trip comedy movie starring is that and like, produced by Tom Brady. Is that built upon the movie Road Trip, or is it just a movie that features a road trip? I, it feels like a movie featuring a road trip rather than a sequel to the movie Road Trip, which would probably be as bad. I, I, don't, I don't know if either one of those scenarios is worse than the other, but neither of them is good. Yeah. Like... Of all the people you could see in the NFL, you know, immediately turning their hand to, some like, funny stuff. to Hollywood movies, Brady's not one of them. Brady's done funny stuff before, though. Yeah, but Especially. like Brady... So, not like Peyton. You know, That's the, the one thing, thing Peyton's better this at. This is the him. thing, right? Yeah. Like, you know, in the world, sometimes there are people that are your direct peers and they're always just obviously better than you at everything, you know, the whole way through. And your entire life becomes just a comparison to this guy that's like 130% of what you are. Yeah. Right, and your life becomes just a misery because of that. You're the also ran guy. You're Robin to somebody else's Batman, and nobody wants that. Right? Nobody looks good in the red tights. Um, so for Brady's entire career, it's been painfully obvious that he's just less funny than Peyton Manning. And it's not that Tom Brady is unfunny. It's just that next to Peyton Manning, you're really not funny. Like Manning is funny, legitimately funny. So Brady took the QB crown, but Peyton took the funny crown. Yes. So now maybe like, Peyton's gonna be in it. <laughs> yeah, but then you're just spend the entire movie being like, why wasn't it? Why wasn't he the star? True. Why did Why did we have to sit through eighty for Brady instead of whatever for Manning? You know, it's a bad idea. It's bad. Look, it might not be as bad an idea as taking whatever like quarter zip you're wearing and just writing Brady on the shoulder and selling it for like two hundred and fifty seven dollars. That he. I think that's a bad plan. idea, but. 
you know what the uh, the margin's going to be on those? Things? I would imagine the the margin is the pretty, margin is good. pretty huge on those. They took a fourteen dollars shirt and ironed on Brady on yeah. a bunch of stuff, and they're That's, selling it for like you don't need to sell a lot. Money. Yeah, margin. By the good. way, do you, do you see this this piece of what is that magic? Thing? This is, I believe, I might be right now. Something after the only human being on the planet Earth wearing a two thousand and seven Uganda Uganda rugby jersey, rugby union. Now. Uganda are not one of the rugby powerhouses in the world. In fact, until I saw this jersey, I wasn't aware they played rugby. You didn't know that? I did. Yeah. But, but this jersey is incredible, isn't it? Like, the colors, the, it, I like it. I'm a fan. Ricky West in the chat says Steve should cameo on 80 for Brady if his charity wins. I will text Tom right now and see if, <laughs> if he needs. <laughs> you do that. Are you looking for uh, But that's for a, a good that's a good way of bringing up the charity stuff. For a giant. So we're both up and running. You Charities having, are live. I need a little bit more airtime here because I well, got my own. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, having disrespected the process and failed to get your homework in on time, are behind the eight ball here. We're going to come so from behind. my charity is up and running. My charity, I'm raising money for a group called Sunshine Kids, which uh, has, like, fun activities, tries to make life a little bit less miserable for kids with cancer, which I think everyone can agree is a very worthwhile cause. They're also a very highly ranked charity, which it turns out is a thing, Right making sure that the money doesn't go on like buying office space and whatever other crap that charities find a way of wasting money. So they're a very highly rated charity. My forfeit is if my money, if my thing raises the most money, I will recreate a Jackson Mahomes TikTok complete with, I've bought myself one of those like chief starter jacket deals. I think I can repurpose the Steve wig for that haircut. I need a big chain. I don't have one of those yet. Um, and God, I need to figure out how I can. No, 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 no. Oh, no. this is the one. I, I, are those jorts or jeans? We would have to raise a lot of money for me to think about recreating a topless Jackson Mahomes TikTok. Um, oh, we need a stretch goal then. That's what I'm saying. We it need would need to be a goal. lot, a lot of money for me to do that. But the regular ones I can handle. Right now, $612 is what we're up to. So let's cook. It's my pin tweet, at PFF underscore Sam. I am Donate money to again. my cause. I'm once again disgusted. At what? That that is like a thing that goes viral. Oh, just the, the nature of... No, the your charity's great. I think it's awesome. Um, I hope you I hope you raised $2,499. Actually, I don't know. I, I kind of hope I raised $2,499 and you, you raised the $2,500. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping we smash past that. I just no, we'll both, we'll both smash there. past it. We'll both do the. I mean, there's a chance we both, we both do the punishment. So I have, I have put myself out there. I announced the charity last time. I didn't announce the, um, what do you call it? For, I, I, I call was, it you a say forfeit, forfeit right? There's like, I said punishment. That sounds bad. Like forfeit, forfeit is a, a good thing, way of doing it. Forfeit is a thing that doesn't appear to quite translate to Yankee. Yeah. It's, it's more of a, an across-the-pond phrase. It works perfectly if you're on the other side of the Atlantic. If you're on this side of the Atlantic, it doesn't seem to quite translate, but I haven't found a good alternative. Like punishment, challenge, whatever, you know? The Forfeit's thing you got to do... We can, we can run with forfeit, but that's, you know, 25% of our audience gets it. Yeah, being, right. Being not here in it's America. It's like the, whatever the thing, you know, the, the thing that people have to do when they lose their fantasy football league, that's basically what we're shooting for. Yeah. The, uh, the Waffle House thing would have been... Uh, would have been a fun one. That would have been a good one. I, I think one of my one of my buddies brought that up when I was talking to him, and he said, "Well, you should do that with something Cincinnati local." And I'm like, "No, don't, I am don't. not gonna eat Skyline every hour on the hour." Or I something would sit like in there that. for 24 hours. I'm not oh, yeah. touching it. I would, yes. But then you get kicked out. You'd have to like drink Sprite. It does for 24 close. Hours. It does close. Oh, that's true. Yeah, too. But even like they're not gonna let you just sit there in an empty, you know, Skyline and not eat. <sighs> anyway. Um, oh, look, so we're, my, up to, we're up to 731 already. Oh, man. All right. I'm falling from. So wait, I need we need to make a comeback here. I am raising money for Heritage House over here in Cincinnati, a faith based recovery program. We, this is the first this is the first charity that we did raise money for. So we want to do this again um, because I know the people here. So I didn't need the I didn't need the charity ranking. I know the people. I know where this is going. And I know many of the men whose lives it has affected so many people who were homeless, who had no hope who had nothing in life in their lives have been radically changed by uh, by Heritage House, which, you know, nine month program. And then you get into some uh, you could become an intern and, and it just becomes a place where not only do you get your life back on track, but you're also giving back to the next men who come through the program. So I believe strongly in the uh, the men at Heritage House. So I'm going to raise money for them. We're, we're going to we put a goal of twenty five hundred dollars and I'm going to do combine drills. So I'm going to go through the combine. 
as my combine, forfeit. Not at the combine, mm-hmm. but I'm going to go through the combine drill. So uh, probably not all of them, but you got the forty, like the forty, the uh, the three cone, the um, why can't I, I always call it pro agility, but the um, the short shuttle, short shuttle. Yeah, I always I always call it pro agility for whatever reason. Okay. So you got the short shuttle. Got to get the hand size done because we because yeah. we got to see, and then we'll put we'll put my percentiles into PFFIQ. One hundred and eight for the hand so size we can thing. see. Yeah, well, I'll be like hundredth percentile hand size. Now, my question for you: the bench, uh, can I do it at a lower weight? No, because two twenty five, it's already gonna like it. It might kill me. Could you? Can you bench two twenty five? No, this is what I'm saying. I already know it's a zero. Oh. So can we you do must have, like you? Can I do 150 or something and try to rep been, it? You must have at one point in your life have been able to bench 225. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some point. At this point in my life, it well, might well, be. What uh, you hit now is a one rep max. <laughs> one rep max for me is probably 185 or something, 200. Well, I don't like, know. If you can get to 200, it feels like you get to 225. If, you know, the, if, if, if things are on the line here. But do, want, do people want to see me? By the way, that's a phenomenal suggestion. <laughs> donate my hair to wigs for kids. <laughs> Your hair's like perfectly, as we get further into this charity thing, we'll see. Your hair's like perfectly purpose made to just bolt onto one of those little dolls. It like that's exactly what it looks like. Can, can we stay focused here? I'm perfectly focused. I I'm going to do that's a combine idea. drills. So you can watch Sam do a little seven second TikTok, or you can watch me do the. the those are way longer than seven seconds. There's a whole routine involved in that thing. Okay, well, whatever. You can watch Sam do a TikTok, or you can watch me do combine drills. Perhaps tear an Achilles or something like that. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of possibilities here as I creep up towards 40 years old. Was it Kyle Brandt that did that? They were yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I think about him all the time. I think about... Pop I, I, that thing right out. Every time I consider doing something fun, I think about Kyle, who's younger than me, Yeah, and did and something fun and ripped his Achilles. Younger with than good you morning and quite football. obviously in better shape than you Slightly are. Slightly better shape. Than either of us are. And he also he doesn't have like the, you know, 6'10 right. limbs. And, and, and the man just went like, pop. The yeah. Achilles right out of his leg. It it really has me shying away from any sort of fun activity. Yeah. Because anytime did the you also you know, did you ever hear the Solly stories of him just bursting that Achilles? Did he too? Yeah, Sol- yeah, playing Sol- basketball. Yeah. He was like, and he made it sound like like a, an inevitability. Like when we were doing the basketball at the Y thing, and I was sort of giving voice to you know I'm I'm not that young anymore. It just feels that like one day you know when you were young you never even thought about bits of your body failing right. You just this is what you do. You carry on. Nothing nothing ever breaks. Now it's like stuff just stops working when you're like getting off the couch and things. So I was like yeah I mean I'm you know and he was like yeah yeah I, I was playing basketball one time and just bam he's like it'll go. You reach that age and just it's gonna pop. I was like what. I did no. Solly, that feels like a small sample size, Solly. Just thinking about the one time his popped. Well, now you're Solly and Kyle Brent. I'm, I'm thinking of, yeah, there's, there's some evidence. Anyway, there. it's your Achilles, so go for it. So that's what we're going to do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do uh, combine drills if we win. we got some catching up to do because uh, Sam's way ahead of me. But uh, go check it out. So it's my pinned tweet, at PFF underscore Steve. Somebody left a comment on mine that said that they donated specifically because I did my homework and respected the process. We're gonna come back. I I get it. I get it. I started from behind, but we're gonna we're gonna come back here. Okay. But uh, anyway, I hope we uh, I hope we both hit our goals. S- uh, exceed our goals. Exceed the goals. Mm-hmm. Are you gonna add the uh, topless stretch goal? I yes. thirty five hundred. No, God, no thirty five hundred. That's gotta be a big number. You with the Double like what's 5, gonna 000? take for you to shave your head thing? Whatever absurd. Taking figure. your shirt off which is a temporary thing <laughs> versus me shaving my head. It's also a temporary thing. It is not. We don't know how it's going to come back. What do you, don't, That's a long time of me being bald. Don't know how it's going to come. Look, as a, as a man with this head, I can, I can promise you that it comes back relatively quickly. Like, I have to shave down to yeah, this absurdity to this level <clears> every like two weeks. Uh, listen, shaving your head is a month-long forfeit. I don't think you, you appreciate the scarring that it will do to people if I have to take my top off. Fair. Maybe it's worth 5000 instead of 3500 That's what I'm saying. Anyway, uh, we appreciate everybody. So, again, we thank everybody because they're, uh, you guys are a part of this. The only reason why we can raise money for charity is because we have great, dedicated listeners and viewers. And if you're timestamping this podcast, this is where you get to where you skip the charity talk because I know there's some people that don't like that. No, I don't care. I don't care. Oh, okay. I don't care anymore. All right. If you want us to skip the charity talk, sorry. Okay. Just, just be a part of it. All right. Okay. How about that? All right, let's. Do you want to get into some football? I mean, look, the faster you donate money, the less we'll talk about it. So, do you want to get into some football? Yeah, 
Right after I remind you that the PFF NFL podcast is sponsored by Western and Southern Financial Group. While you focus on your roster moves, Western and Southern helps advance your money moves. Buying your first home? Planning to start a family? Wondering how to make your money grow? Well, Western and Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions help you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand your needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. All right, we got some emails that so you guys have fueled this entire show here mm-hmm. too. So, but so I've discovered recently there are a tranche of emails that get trapped in my spam folder. In addition to there's ones that like Google spam, you know, uh, prevents from getting through to the mailbox, and I have to go in every now and again and like say yes, this is a real email. I would like this to hit my mailbox. There's also a bunch that it then just like randomly steals and throws in the spam folder. So I found a bunch of emails recently that had been lost in that regard that I had to rescue. I don't, I don't know why. Yeah, it hits my spam a little bit. Too. Google seems to be very reluctant to actually give me these emails. But anyway, we are getting through <laughs> all of the ones we see. Uh, so the first email that came through, I just thought was an interesting thing that somebody brought up. And it, it, it kind of speaks to the thought processes and the, the things that need to be in your mind when you're making these trades for future draft picks in particular. Um, so this one is, hello, I have an NFL draft question I'd love for you guys to hit on. Once the Dolphins got the 49ers draft pick for the Niners to move up for Trey Lance, uh, they then traded up and gave a pick to the Eagles. They traded their pick instead of that Niners pick. And because of it, they are 14 picks further back in this upcoming draft. Why would they do this, considering the 49ers are expected to be better and thus would likely have a better draft pick? Thanks, Joe Bresson. I mean, I assume it's because the other teams are making their own estimates, right? Well, there's a couple of elements. One, we don't know if they had a choice, right? Like, it might have been a stipulation on the part of the Eagles that, hey, we're only interested in the, you know, that pick, not the other one. So who knows? A, if they even had the option of trading the other pick or not. Right. That, that's one part of it. But the other thing is, with hindsight, it's very easy to say, hey, the 49ers are expected to be better. But if you go back and put yourself in Miami's shoes, this is part of the, the danger with the way they, quote unquote, overachieved a year ago, right? They accelerated where they were supposed to be. They got to double digit wins. They were on the precipice of the playoffs. Uh, two of the young quarterback going forward. Remember, they thought that their offensive line would take a big step forward in year two. If you're Miami, you could easily talk yourself into the idea that we're actually gonna be a pretty good team this year. And if you're the 49ers, you now know that they're taking a rookie quarterback, right, at the top of the draft, right. once they've made that trade. So you're looking at this and you're saying, we're going to be a, a double-digit win team. We're going to be in the playoffs. The 49ers are starting a rookie. They might not be that good at all. So there's very – I think there's an easy way of, if you're Miami, talking yourself into the idea that actually the other pick would have been the, the better one. Um, but obviously the way the season panned out, it didn't at all. But the point being that – like these are the. This is how badly it can go if you get that screwed up, right? That essentially trading what could easily be the same first round draft pick is now the difference of half a round in the first round this year. And, well, then on the other side, like the Eagles are probably making their own calculation too, right or wrong, saying, "Well, we'd rather have the Niners pick, or we'd rather have the right. Dolphins pick." And that's what I'm saying. We don't even yeah. know if Miami was ever given the option right. to um, to trade the other pick. Like it might, the Eagles might have only been interested in this pick. Uh, looking back now, so Miami moved from 12 to 6 yes. to go get Jalen Waddell. And so now that, this is this is the issue with trading up, right? Jalen Waddell's a really good player. Looks like they're going to be able to build around him nicely. Was he Is he worth two first-rounders, though? Because they had this other first round. And I know last year at this time people were saying, oh, it's house money, right? I mean, it's, it's this extra pick, essentially, I, that I, you've yeah, earned. And you, I, were the, you were the one person that – no, did you bounce – no, you were the one who said house money. A yeah. lot of people pushed back against it. Um, so now you can have your rebuttal because you thought it was house money. It's Jalen Waddell plus, uh, what, one of the late teen picks, right? 14, I think. Uh, where is it? I can tell you right now. 15. So it's Jalen Waddell – for what you could have had at 12 plus what you could have at 15 this year. And that's the danger. That is where you, that's where it's really risky but my trading point, up. But my point at the time, and I'll maintain it now, is that I don't think you look at that as two separate trade entities. If I'm Miami last year, I believe firmly, only traded back to where they did, or only traded up, rather, because they traded back. You know what I mean? It was all one move. Yeah. It was a calculated thing of, 
we move back from three to six and we pick up the extra first. They're not looking at it as we trade back from three to 12, was it? And they went from three to 12, right, back pick up, up to two, six. and then we trade up to six. They're not looking at it like that. They're looking at it as we trade back from three to six, we pick up an extra first, and we're, we're ahead, right? So to me, I think they only make that move viewed through that lens. I don't think they were ever in a position where they were saying, well, now that we've traded back to 12, do we even really want to trade up or do we just want to sit here at 12 and see what happens? Like, I think they literally only made the deal as a kind of, it was like a three-way trade, essentially, in their eyes. So but I think I think parsing it a peak, uh, I think separating it out into these different components, I just don't think is fair to the way they were looking at it, at it. Because I don't think it, in their eyes, it was never two separate components. It was just, this is what we're doing. We're trading back and we're picking up a first. The but fact were they, that they wrong? Didn't, Huh? Were they wrong, though, in evaluating it that way? Because now, hindsight, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when they traded up to six, we were, we were also saying, man, there might be six blue chip players in this draft, right? With, they might have a shot at Panay Sewell. They might have a shot at Jamar Chase, right? They might have a shot at these players that um, we probably weren't thinking. Were we thinking? Yeah, we were thinking Chase at the time. That they, those guys could drop just a little bit. Kyle Pitts could have technically been there. Did they get a blue chipper in Jalen Waddell? I, they may have just gotten right there at the cutoff. And, and Waddle's good, man. I think you know he's a very good player. But, again, it is also fair to question their reasoning and say, okay, it's Jalen Waddle versus the value of two other players. You know, They would have been out of the Micah Parsons sweepstakes. I, I forget who they could have exactly had at 12. They could have, been a play, they could have even gotten more picks for somebody trading up for Justin Fields, actually. Uh, but they, they, could have been, they could have had another player at 12 plus whoever they get this year at 15, and you're weighing the value of those two players versus one Jalen Waddle. That's still a fair way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing is they would have likely been the the top three receivers on the board. Chase, Devontae Smith, and Jalen Waddle would likely have all been gone when 12 rolled around. You can't say that with certainty. They were gone yeah. as it happened. No, they would have been. You can't say that in certainty because Miami picked one of them, so who knows what would have happened once that domino uh, fell in a, different, in a different universe. But in theory, all three of those guys could have been gone. Then you're down to Kadarius Toney, Rashad Bateman. I don't know if they love any of those guys the way they obviously loved Jalen Waddell. Um, potentially, they pivot to offensive line and actually make a bigger impact on the team. Like, the upgrade, Rashad Slater went at 13 to Miami. Like, what if Miami all of a sudden didn't get any of the wide receivers they H- love? Hindsight is, is really, really 2020. I yeah, mean, it's, cl- it's clear as day. But So if you're in Miami, would you rather have – Rashawn Slater, right now, Rashawn Slater instead of Jalen Waddle plus the fifteenth overall pick. So you could have you could have the left your left tackle of the future. Probably not. Plus you're picking at fifteen. I don't know, man. I mean, ultimately, you still need four other guys on that offensive line. Like the thing is, their offensive line needs a complete overall. You always say that, but you got to start somewhere. You have to start with one player. You you do, but starting with that one player takes away like the one good thing you have on offense. Waddle is really good. Hey, I'm just we're just bringing it up, man. We're just bringing it up. Fair yeah. discussion. Okay. And good question. What else you got here? Uh, this one is from somebody called Kenny McKee. Uh, hi, guys. Really enjoy this. Sh- this is, I like this. You know, the way the, you know, it's, really enjoy the show. You guys are great, blah, blah, blah. That's him, not me. Yeah. Uh, anyway, here's the question. Well, you got to preface it. You got you to gotta butter us up if you're going to get this on the podcast. <laughs> I, just, I like the way, you know, you just, yeah. you treat that with the same kind of disdain we treat it with. Insert nice things here. Mm. Uh, does having more draft picks so this was there was a typo in this I hope I'm getting the gist of what he was actually shooting for it was a little bit unclear does having more draft picks make the picks lower quality it's anecdotal but it looks to me uh, as if teams without first or second round picks seem to hit on their later picks has there been any analysis done on this so I think essentially what he's asking is does having does trading away your picks or just having fewer of them in a draft essentially make you, I don't know, focus more on the picks you have left? Do you have a, is it, do you, do you have a greater ability to hit on those few picks that you do have left, whether you train strategy or not, um, or is simply, you know, buying as many lottery tickets as humanly possible the best way of doing this? And this is interesting to me because I wrote a thing that's maybe out today or maybe out tomorrow about the Rams draft strategy and to what extent are teams going to follow that and and replicate it and all this kind of stuff because you know the Les Snead meme you know F them picks 
it, it isn't really what they're doing. You know, if you look at the number of times, they are, since 2016, which was the last first-round pick they had and the last first-round pick they're going to have until 2024. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Since that year, the Rams are seventh in total number of overall draft picks, right? Since Lesney took over in 2012, they are also seventh. So they've had a top 10 number, just volume of draft picks, despite trading away every first round pick between 2016 and 2024. Um, if you look at the last, and it, it's not like this is a recent pivot either, because if you look at the last two years, nine draft picks in each year, I think from when we did this the first time around, I think they're going to end up with like nine or something this year as well. They always backfill and end up picking a lot of times in the draft, which it might not be a better strike rate, but the strike rate generally of just drafting players is enough that you're going to hit on a couple of guys, which is all you need to come out of in any given draft year. Yeah, so I have a couple anecdotal ones to discuss. So to, to answer the basic question of if you pick fewer times, are you, are, are you better off? Are you more focused? Whatever. I'm going to go back to the Jets. 2009 and 2010 they drafted seven times in two years in 2009 and 2010 so they made a move to go get mark sanchez at quarterback obviously i mean say what you want about that he did go to two afc championships but you didn't really hit on your pick as the franchise quarterback but with those seven picks in two years they also spent a third on sean green the running back they did find a very good starting guard Matt Slauson in the sixth round in 2009. In, the, in 2010, their four picks, Kyle Wilson, the corner, had an average career as a slot corner, but below average first round. Wide production. receiver chaperone. That's, what you call, that's who you called the wide receiver chaperone? Yep. I always think you said that to Steven Nelson. Nope. About Steven Nelson. So Kyle Wilson, you called the, the wide receiver chaperone. Uh, Vlad Dukas, underwhelming career at guard and tackle. Joe McKnight, rest in peace, another running back. And then John Connor, the uh, the Terminator, who was a fullback. So, so this is where strategy could be bad. What the Jets had seven picks in two years. They spent two on running backs and one on a fullback. Yeah, I mean, there's there's it, there is the the argument that having fewer draft picks is bad just on its face, and then there's what you do with those draft picks. Um, let me give you a counterpoint to just the idea that not having as many draft picks is automatically bad. Number Since 2017, uh, the number of total draft picks. Do you know who the bottom two teams in the NFL are? Fewest draft picks made since 2017. Since 2017? Yes. Um, I don't know offhand. Number 32, the New Orleans Saints. I was, I was drafted, thinking Saints, but they'd had that one year where they drafted a ton. They have drafted just 29 times since yeah. 2017. Number 31, Kansas City. So the, the Saints and the Chiefs are the bottom two teams in the NFL. Now, then it starts to get kind of random, right? Because the Bears are, are 30. The Houston Texans are 29. Then the Tennessee Titans, who've been pretty good. The Atlanta Falcons, who've been kind of all over the map. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Like, it's the bottom two teams have been really good over that period of time. Then it starts to get like 50-50, right? They either suck or they're good. So it's not, like, it's not just an automatic thing that if you don't draft very often, you're going to be bad. No, I agree. So looking at the Saints and the Chiefs, though, doesn't that just show the value of the quarterback? I mean, the re so sure. starting, starting with the value of the quarterback, in the Chiefs' case, the value of their, their trio, the top three, right? Mahomes, Kelsey, and Tyreek Hill can solve a lot of issues. With the Saints, they're probably the one that bucks the – because if you look at the Chiefs' roster minus the top three, is it good? Do the Chiefs have a good roster if you take away their three stars? Which is significant, but I mean, they're three stars who were acquired before this point here. I don't think it's bad, but it's not good. It's middle of the pack, yeah. right? Middle of the pack roster. You could look at the Saints roster over the last couple of years, though, and say it's top five, and that they have bucked the trend. So they had Drew Brees, great, but also had a top five roster. But that also goes back to the point, uh, Timo's work last year. Who has hit on draft picks over the last 10 years? The Saints were number one. Yeah, so that's the thing, right, is that it is the number of draft picks, as long as you're hitting enough, it almost doesn't matter what the number you actually pick is. The, the key is how good are you at that and whether you can realistically sustain it over a period of time. So one of the big things about this Ram strategy is, one, 
they do maintain a lot of draft picks. Like they're not high value ones. They've they've firmly calculated that there is a value to having proven NFL players at key positions that outweighs the fact that you're paying them a lot of money and you have to give up important first round draft picks to get them, right? Yep. And it's difficult to argue with that given how things have worked out for them so far. But also an element of that strategy is that some of the picks they've kept around have produced some really good players. Like Cooper Cup in the mid rounds was arguably their best player this season. Second best player, Aaron Donald. Um, So as long as you can keep every now and again hitting on a Cooper Cup from somewhere, you can, that offsets a lot of the fact that like eight of your picks were six rounders. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, but the flip side of that is if you start missing, that's when this thing on spools in a hurry. Like, you, there's only so many Tutu Atwells you can make before the, the wheels fall off. Right. And again, I think, I think the Rams did a nice they, – they have done a nice job of finding starters at less valuable positions later in the draft, plus a Cooper Cup, right? So Cooper Cup – but by the way, Cooper Cup before this year was a hit, right? It was like, wow, you find a, you find a really good slot receiver – kudos now they found a super bowl mvp you know so it looks that much better but prior to this year it was it was merely a hit now it's like wow that's one of the best picks of recent history but i I think more realistically you're seeing a starting safety here and there a starting linebacker on days two and three and that's i think part of the strategy as well you're in, in offensive linemen you're just finding starting caliber players and it's not necessarily superstars cooper cup superstar other than that, it's pretty much starting caliber players, and that's and then they're and that's what you need. That is that is that is a win in the draft, I think. Right, is just finding starting caliber players. Yeah, and and, and again, this is part of the Rams strategy, right? Other than Cooper Cup and Aaron Donald, but like you you traded for Jalen Ramsey and traded for Matthew Stafford and got Von Miller and got Obj. Like you're finding your stars by other means, and you're filling in the your starting lineup through the draft. Um, at the same time. Can you bank on that going forward? Can the Saints actually look at themselves and say, hey, we're the best drafting team over the last 10 years. We're going to keep it up. Therefore, we can draft less. Uh, same thing with the Rams. We always found day three picks because I keep coming back to the Seahawks. I how, do. how did the Seahawks go from the best drafting team that unlocked every gem yeah. and had this incredible multi-year run of Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Russell Wilson and Bobby Wagner, and then they hit a lull for like five years? The um, the Rams strategy is interesting because it because they maintain a large number of picks and because they're trading the valuable ones for really focused, specific, high value and high therefore high impact players and positions. There's a certain logic to it, right? You can look at that and you say you don't really I mean the whole point in getting these first round players is that you get an impact playmaker at an important area right and if you in certain positions it's a real bargain like quarterback obviously if you nail a first round quarterback jackpot but at other positions as the higher up the first round you go they're not actually that cheap like the rookie contract at certain positions is not a bargain the way right. it is for quarterbacks <clears throat> so in a lot of ways True. it actually makes a lot of sense to trade those picks away be really happy in the guarantee that you're getting a guy back and then backfill with all these picks and still be able to just draft in volume and hope you get enough to stick. Where it becomes less defensible as a strategy is when you start talking about a team like New Orleans. And if you believe there's something to the idea that they're better at evaluating than other people, it excuses even less the approach of trading away your picks just to move up in the draft to get somebody, right? Because if you're better at evaluating than everybody else, then you shouldn't need to go and find guys. You shouldn't need to go up to chase guys that other teams covet, right? Yeah, you take should better players. Exactly. You should be able to work on the basis that I'm better at this than you are, so I can sit wherever I draft and get a better player than you wasted 15 picks earlier. You, the like that. It's actually it's it seems to be creating the opposite behavior to the one it should produce if you want to gain an edge from that, right? The fact that they're if they're that good at drafting, they're essentially able to offset the waste that they're doing by trading up. What you really want to do is to say, like, being this good allows us to not have to do that at all. In fact, we could trade back, get more picks, or do what the Rams do and trade them away for something else more valuable because we're better at this than you are. I have more to add. 
in a second here. But first, Hoops fans, the latest offer from DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is too good to pass up. New customers can bet just $1 in any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't yet available in your state, you can still take your shot at a big payday. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Basketball Contests. And DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. You bet just $1 on any NBA team and you get $150 in free bets if they win. It's promo code PFF at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Must be 21 or older. Minimum age or location requirements vary by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for full list of requirements and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. I think the Seahawks are an interesting proxy for this. They didn't go extre- this extreme as the Rams. They went three out of four years without a first-round pick. Remember, they kept trading for Jimmy Graham and Percy Harvin. Mm-hmm. Uh, most recently, they traded for Jamal Adams. We mentioned that. So working backwards, last year they drafted three times, the Seahawks, and we thought that was a disastrous strategy. Now, if you look back and it's like, well, they gave up a draft pick for Gabe Jackson or they gave up or whatever. Is that what it was? For Gabe, right? Um, that's not bad, right? Picking up a starter, I think he was a fifth rounder. Yeah. That's not a bad in isolation. But when you come out of the draft with three players and your second round picks, Dwayne Eskridge, right? So to answer this question. You put some respect on Dwayne's name. He's good. Or D. He is. So are you more focused on those picks? I don't think so because two years prior, Seattle also had the beautiful move of turning one pick into six, one of whom, one of, one of those picks was DK Metcalf. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a draft where they turned one player into DK Metcalf, and I forget the exact other players, Phil Haynes and Ben burke Curvin and all, but it was six players total, one of which was DK Metcalf. That's what, that should be the ultimate goal. That should be the win, right? You turn one pick into multiple, and if you get two out of there, you're winning, whereas Eskridge obviously isn't as good as DK Metcalf. He was one of three picks last year, and they got almost zero production out of any of their three picks last year, and that, in addition to Russell Wilson's injury, was a big part of why Seattle regressed. But in previous years, they were given up first-round picks left and right for Jimmy Graham and Percy Harvin and all those guys, and that didn't necessarily pay off. And they also offset it by doing what the Rams did. They had a lot of years where they picked 10 times and 11 times and 10 times and all that stuff. But they hit a bit of a lull in their drafting ability, right? Seattle easily could have come into the 2014 draft and been like, man, we're good at this. We're really good at this. So if we draft more, we have an advantage. We have the edge. But I don't think historically anybody has been proven to have an edge as far as hit rate goes. And an edge, by the way, is like 5%, 10%. Right. You might have runs of being 5 or 10% better than others, but it's just it's really difficult to sustain. Yeah, I mean, to answer the question, my – a, I don't think it's been massively studied. B, True. It, uh, beyond that, right? Beyond the fact that there isn't anybody that appears to have a long-term proven ability to do this dramatically better or worse than anybody else. Like, it's it's just variance. Um, but I don't think there is substance to the idea that if you shrink down the number of picks, right, if you're only dealing with three or four in a year, you are better. Uh, you have a higher hit rate on those three or four. I think you just notice the ones where it does hit. Um, because of the fact that they had a weird low number of picks. But I do think that overall there is merit to the idea of, you know, for the last 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is, the idea that you build through the draft, right, that maxim, and nothing is more valuable than draft picks, and that's what you need to do. You need to stockpile the draft. Like, that's how you build. That's been drilled into everybody. And I think the Rams are just chipping away at that and saying, you know what, there's a different way of using those valuable assets, yeah. And you can parlay them into proven NFL commodities. And as long as you backfill, right, as long as you don't just go, screw it, we traded away everything, which is ironically the thing that people say they've done, right, is we just trade away everything. We have no draft picks. As long as you still st- like maintain a stockpile and you go every year and you pick nine times, you can end up sustaining that for a while. The other, the other, I'm still of the mind that you stockpile draft picks. But again, it's not always to use them. It's because there's also somewhat high-priced veterans that you can afford, right? The Calais Campbell trade for a fifth rounder a couple of years ago. Uh, it always seems to be Baltimore. Baltimore picked up Anquan Bolden, like a legitimate number two receiver about 10 years ago. That was a big part of their Super Bowl run for like a fourth rounder. So you also accumulate picks so you can make those deals when they're available. Uh, even Arizona a couple of years ago just throwing a two for DeAndre Hopkins, right? I mean, it's like just having picks 
so you have the flexibility when trades are available, when, when veterans are, ve are available. That's another reason to stockpile picks, not always to just use them. Yeah. You got another uh, email? I do. Uh, okay. So this one is effectively about the thing we've talked about for a long time, creep, <coughs> creep back toward average on the offensive line. Uh, gents, love the show. Thank you for the many hours of pleasure on my walk, uh, morning walks. You mentioned that you think the overall quality of offensive line as a whole has a weakest link aspect to it. Uh, to make for a simple thought experiment, suppose you could guarantee that the five starters in your offensive line had an average individual PFF grade of 70. That is 350 points among the five. If you believe that the quality of an offensive line really was strictly 100% a weakest link situation, then you would want to distribute the 350 points equally across the five offensive linemen. So every single guy had a 70. But maybe you think it's not quite a weakest link world. If you could magically guarantee that your starting five would have individual PFF grades that added up to 350, how would you dole out those points? For example, suppose that you think the left tackle and the center were a bit more important. You could have those two starters each have a PFF grade of 85, and the rest of the line could each get grades of 60. I know this is a gross oversimplification, but how would you allocate the 350 points across the offensive line? Uh, thanks, Norm from Virginia. So this effectively is asking, is it strictly a weakest link thing, or is there still some value to the to positional strength, to position value on the offensive line, and are you actually better off carrying a weak link that you can hide in the right position? I, so I think there are – there's probably something mathy that we could do with this <laughs> to test it out that we haven't done yet. So we're more just hypothesizing here, right? We're just theorizing. Yeah. I mean, so the thing – it's one of those things where, as he says, it's a gross oversimplification, right? And when we say creep back toward average in the offensive line, it's a gross oversimplification of what you actually need to do yeah. for any individual team. The general point is you want to make sure – the, the, the thing you should be aiming at generally if you're a team, particularly a team with a bad offensive line, is let's try and get all five of these guys to the point where none of them is a liability. Right. And if we do that, we have a good offensive line. Now, where it gets more complicated than that is you say, all right, we need to do this player by player. And sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you have the choice of do we draft player X or re-up player X for a giant sum of money knowing that he is a better player than our creep back toward average maxim, and that might cost us getting back to average in a different other position. And at that point, I think you end up, so that runs contrary to your just get five average guys, but it is the kind of decision that you might need to make along the way and is a better alternative than just trying to get five stooges. So I think because, because our O-line has dependency though too, you probably can get away with one below average player because he's going to be helped, right? You can, because you can help one player schematically and strategically and, and, and then have better play elsewhere. A big part of this, though, too, is us knowing how we do our grading system, right? So in our grading system, from a pass blocking standpoint, we focus on the losses, not necessarily the quality of the wins, right? So we're asking linemen to not lose, right? And I, and I think that makes sense, right? So whether you, whether you take a guy to the ground in pass protection or you mirror him, or doesn't matter as long as you keep him away from the quarterback it's pretty much a win right you're keeping the pocket clean you're doing your job to keep the pocket clean so then you would debate if i have joe thomas at left tackle and he's only going to lose once per game right but my right guard's going to lose seven times which is huge does it matter does it matter if i even that out and it's like three losses from left tackle and four from right guard does that actually matter and i don't necessarily think it does but it's when you have multiple guys on the line, they're going to lose five times per game, as you said, that it, that's when it's, it's a hindrance, right? It's multiple people that are making it difficult to run your offense, especially on third downs and the times when you have to pass. So I don't think even distribution – I don't think it needs to be perfectly even distribution, especially from a pass protection standpoint, because we're just trying to minimize the losses up front in the, in the speed of the losses. And that can have, and the other the other part I would say too, sometimes if you have too many exact average, like Mike Remmers is a good example, right? He's had a pretty good career. If you look at his PFF grades, they're average to slightly above average, right? But Mike Remmers is also the type of player when he faces Von Miller, he's got no shot, right? There are certain players 
who are average theoretically, who are who become a liability against elite players, and that kind of works. Again, you you can't if you have all of those guys, there'll be certain games when you still run into problems. So there is value in having better players. Yeah, and to me, there is still there's still something to position value on the offensive line. And I think there's a couple of positions where if you're going to have a weak link, you know, if you end up in that, in that situation of having to make a decision of, do I main, do I keep an elite player around or let them walk and try and replace that with two average guys? You know, do I, do I keep an elite player around and just accept whatever I get at the one remaining position? Or do I try and let him walk and use those resources to get two average guys in the le- at the left tackle and the other position. I think you can. I think you default and keep the elite guy around. And I think if you're going to have a weak link, left guard and one of your two tackle spots are the spots to have them in. And as much as left tackle and right tackle, it is very similar. You'd still rather have the weak link be your right tackle, just because the number of times that it's it's his blind side on the left side is still more. Right. Right. As much as blind side can still be the right side, even for a right handed quarterback, if he drops back and he's looking at the left Don't side. Don't hurt my brand here, Sam. Don't not, hurt my brand. It, as much as if he drops back and he's look he's working the left side of the field, the right side is blind, right? He can be hit from the quote unquote open side and it is a blind hit. He never knows it's coming. So it's not always that just the left is the blind side every time. But the way the target distributions work and the way that, you know, dead down the center, you have a better line of sight when you're turned this way. Right. You, the right side is more um, open than the, the left side, and the left side is more the blind side. The other times that we've seen historically where a very good player has made – he's made enough of an impact, impact to take an entire line pretty much from bad to average. Larry Tunsil with the Texans and Dwayne Brown with the Seattle Seahawks. Right. Right, those, but they were replacing two of the worst tackle left tackles, yeah. respectively, that we've seen. Right, so you were going from Julian Davenport in Houston, and all of a sudden, Laramie Tunsil cuts his pressure rate in a third, and all of a sudden, the Texans' offensive line is so much better. So my logic for those two spots being the ones you would accept a weak link being one, if it's your right tackle or either tackle, but the right one would be the preferable one. It's easier to help a tackle than it is any other position on the offensive line in terms of if this guy is a disaster, I can put a chip block there every single play without that much of a problem, right? Tight ends can chip before releasing. Running backs can chip on the way out. You don't even need to keep a guy in all play, you know, and take him out of the pass pattern. You can just have him help on the way out by alignment, by actually jumping in with a chip, all those kinds of things. So right tackle would be one and then left guard because generally the line is turning to the left the center is turning to the left and the left guard is the guy that's going to have more help the right guard oftentimes is the guy who is one-on-one with a and that's why you know Hakeem Adeniji in the Super Bowl was going to be such a problem because in order to save him you essentially had to change the protection for almost every single play to turn the center in his direction and to help out against Aaron Donald. So if you have a choice of, do I maintain an elite left tackle knowing that my left guard and or right tackle is going to be a problem, or do I try and let him walk and get two average players, I'd keep the left tackle. Yeah, and the, the, the part of ha- having a, bad, a really bad weakness, though, you've got teams that can game plan, but to your point, you have, you have ways to combat that, right? Yeah. So... And ultimately, like... So we don't have a clean answer for this, necessarily. Yeah, but... So, if you run into an Aaron Donald, you're going to have problems. Right? There's no way around that. But, A, I like my ability to be able to help out either a left guard or a right tackle. But, B, if you do get five average guys, remember, like, this is the weakness of that thing. That doesn't get you a great offensive line. It gets you a good enough offensive line. And five average guys going up against Aaron Donald, those guys are getting wrecked anyway. No, that's so true. like that's the big. Aaron, Aaron Donald can't be the baseline because he. But that's the thing. So crush and Aaron Donald and or whatever elite player, right? You're going to run up against elite pass rushers that are going to wreck your plan anyway. Right. So the if I can keep an elite player around that I can completely forget about, because generally speaking, elite blockers shut down elite rushers. If I do keep that elite left tackle, now I can literally forget about that guy for the whole game, and I just have to worry about the other positions. Whereas if you do succeed in this plan of getting five average starters that against most teams are good enough to get it done, 
you're going to run into those elite players that banjacks the whole system, and you need right. to you need to get them help anyway. Right. The Bengals' offensive line didn't become an issue just because they ran into the Rams. It was an issue ahead of time yes. before that. Um, did we answer the question then? So it's like maybe. <laughs> yeah. There's I mean, there's there are different ways to do it. The, uh, in my opinion, point, it isn't. In my opinion, it is a it's a an aspirational goal to just get five average starters if your offensive line sucks. But it's the the question to me is essentially is there still a position value element to the strategy? And I would argue yes, there is. Yeah, and I would say my main goal is to not achieve a top five offensive line collectively. It's to, but it is to not have a bottom five or yes. bottom ten offensive line collectively. Right. And there are different ways to construct that, but as a unit, at least be in the middle of the pack. And right. that includes run blocking too. And the more we've studied this too, because pass protection is still dependent on the the QB, right? The actual results are dependent on the QB. The line has more of an impact in the run game when and teams are still running a lot. And as long as teams are running a lot, run blocking does matter. Yeah, and there's certainly no, like, it's not a bad thing to have an amazing offensive line. Like, the only issue is when it starts to become super expensive and they have to do right. it. Is it, it is worth it? Right, exactly. It's not a negative to have, have a great offensive line. It's just from a resource standpoint, is it taking you away from something else? Yeah. All right, we got to tell you about our friends over at All22. This is very exciting. I, I have a very special mug mm. from our friends over at All22. And yesterday was 2 right? All Tuesday. Tuesday. Yes. Tuesday was, on Tuesday. It was on Tuesday. I mean, it was, people got really excited by that. I didn't realize how exciting it was. I thought it was only the All 22 unveil day, but I realized other people were celebrating too. They have just unveiled the newest fantasy football game that hundreds of PFF employees have been playing. That's right. We played this last year. All 22 uses weekly PFF grades as one of its main scoring components and tests your ability to build a full 53-man roster including offensive line, which we were just talking about. So yep. you could use all of this great content from Figure us. It out yourself. All of a sudden, we're a fantasy podcast because we're talking O-line and we're preparing you for the next generation of fantasy football. If you've ever dreamt of sitting in an NFL front office, if you enjoy the scouting process, you're going to want to check out All22. You could join the wait list on all-22.com with nothing more than your email. So you just put in your email all-22.com. If you join the waitlist before the NFL draft, you'll receive a special promo code for your All22 subscription. Waitlist users uh, will even gain access to premium contents like inaugural draft guides, in-season strategies, feature release announcements, and more. Be sure to follow at All22 underscore PFF on Twitter. Now, the guys that started this uh, have done a great job because I know we, you know, we were, we were talking about this years ago. Like, oh, imagine if we did fantasy football with this idea line. predates you at PFF. Like, this idea has been around for so long. Honestly, you could make a case that this concept is the reason PFF exists because when all of those original guys were a member of a football forum, chat forum, essentially. Um, we used to have this thing, I think, called the Monster Draft, where it was essentially a fantasy draft, right? And Neil Hornsby was involved, me, Khaled, Ben Stockwell, all those guys, and we would draft these full teams of NFL players, like with no, no, like, that was it. You just draft, and it's like, who had the best team? Yeah, you did. Well done. See you next year. You know, that was the deal, right? So that was a kind of how we all knew each other in the first place, but B. When we started doing this, me and Khaled in particular were always pushing for this idea of what if we had a fantasy game where offensive linemen were actually a thing, right? And instead of just focusing on yards and touchdowns for receivers and blah, 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 PPR points per reception, let's, let's actually draft offensive linemen. And, you know, Trent Williams last year could have been a fantasy league winner for you, right? With the best season we've ever graded for an offensive tackle. So finally, these guys come along and they were willing to do all the development and IT legwork to make it happen. And they showed the, what are the, the beta, the prototype last year, and we all played it. And now they're, they're, there's a chance for everyone else to get it. So if you've sat there and wanted to draft offensive linemen and every other position, this is your game. Yeah, they've, uh, they've done a great job with it. They used to, I mean, they came out, pitched us the idea a few years ago. We were real excited about being a part of it. And then they uh, continued to, to work on it. They came out. We did a live draft last year. Uh, I think I beat you one on one in our in our matchup, at least. Remember, I was I was hinting at this on the podcast. I was saying, you know, uh, Taylor Decker was on my team and he got hurt. It was hurting my fantasy team and all that mm -hmm. stuff. We, we were dropping hints, but it's official right now. And they gave us our own customized mugs. That's right. Look at this, all twenty two, and I got my own Twitter handle on it. If you could see that on the camera, at pff underscore Steve, 
So we got our own. And by the way, my wife has hijacked this thing. She loves the All-22 mug. I've, this is like the second time I've used it. But we're real excited to be a part of this. So, uh, so go check it out and uh, add your name to the wait list, all-22.com. We'll have more and more on this. And it's, uh, look at the tagline, all 22, less fantasy, more football. Yeah. I like that. All right, you got one more email to wrap this thing up? Yep, last email. This one from John Hurl. And this guy gave me a pronunciation pronunciation guide to his name, which I appreciate. Because it's spelt H-O-E-R-L. You, you know, you could have gone either way with that. Hurl. Hi, gentlemen. Uh, long-time listener, first-time communicator with an observation and a question about the value of kickers in today's NFL. Your recent discussions about positional needs, free agents, and pa- uh, player rankings have been rather dismissive of the value slash importance of special teams to the point where you don't include special teams positions at all, particularly kickers. And yet, we're coming off an exciting postseason that saw every game from the divisional round onwards decided by a field goal. The one exception, Chiefs-Bills, featured a game-tying field goal nearly at the end of regulation. Uh, Late game strategies are clearly influenced by the ability of the kicker. My hometown Ravens are a prime example, given Justin Tucker's extraordinary range and accuracy. And many fringe players often stick with teams because of their ability to contribute on special teams. My question, why so dismissive of the values of kickers and teams, special teams generally, when they are frequently important to the outcome of games? Love the show. Thanks, John Hurl. Great question. Justify yourself, Palazzolo. All right, we'll start with this. By the way, did you... so the we talked about your haircut and whether you just should just get a buzz cut. Somebody responded with Steve Palisol glow, and that's the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. I think you should go with that. You should change your Twitter handle. <laughs> my, I had a friend who used to call me Palazofro. That's not so, nearly as good as Palisol glow. Palisol glow. <laughs> Can we get the music, the soul glow music from Coming to America, and just stitch it on? God, Someone else incredible. in the chat said I should dress up as Bob Ross with his afro and go through a whole painting session. Hell yes. Might need to change the combine. Hell Will yeah. that bring the money we in? Got the window. We could set up a giant easel. I'll give here. options as my as my forfeit then. I could do a Bob Ross paint. Oh my gosh, could you imagine? You could recreate the Soul Glow ad. <coughs> the one yeah. from Coming to America? Where you, you know, the, 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 yes, do that. Well, so I might give three options. High pitched, you know. You could see me do the combine, song. Bob Ross, or Soul Glow ad. We <laughs> also have options. I'm going to start future. donating to these. I want to see all those. Yeah. Um, anyway, special teams. So special teams is they say it's a third of the game. Yeah, it's, it's like a, it's like a ninth of the game. It's about 11 percent of the game, and most of those plays have no impact. Right? They're just kickoffs into the end zone and all that stuff. So the kicker thing, it's it's coming from a Ravens fan, so I can understand how yeah. he feels the importance of a game. Um, so the first thing starts with the kicker studies, Justin right? Justin Tucker is a unicorn. Yeah. We cannot predict kicker performance. With the exception of Justin Tucker. Right. J- Justin Tucker. There are so many good kickers who have good two years and then hit a lull. And just predicting right. kicker every, performance is I mean, we talk is, about it all the time. Every t- difficult. Every, <laughs> you know, kicker, like the, the Bengals, right? Evan Phillips? McPhillips? What was yeah. his name? I don't even remember the guy. McPherson. Name. So McPherson, McPhillips is go. the Bengals McPhillips. fan. Yes, yes, yes. That works for us. Anyway. Confuses me, too. I know. They draft a kicker, goes on this incredible run, is a big part of them being where they they were this season in the Super Bowl. And yet you're like, what is the over under on the amount of time like he still has with the Bengals before he goes on like a, you know, gets the yips and suddenly they cut him and he's now kicking for the Panthers in two years' time, right? That's the way it works with all these guys. Every like all these elite kickers you look at and you're like, that guy a few years ago was done. They like, couldn't kick and somebody got rid of him. The only guy that seems to be able to weather those like d- d- disasters of confidence is somehow Mason Crosby, who's had like three of those in his career where he's forgotten how to kick and the Packers are just like, yeah, I'll come back. And he does. But every other kicker, they just they go through these runs of being incredibly accurate and great and then they forget and it goes to hell. The only guy that doesn't is Justin Tucker. Harrison Butker is really good, but that dude like just misses extra points randomly. I mean, it, it's it's all of those guys. Um, the other thing you'll say, I would say, so if most kickers are above eighty percent, right, in in kicking field goals, it in the big picture, it's really a small difference, right, between the best and the worst, right. Now, of course, it's different if you can set up a sixty-one yarder for Tucker and he's just going to boot it through the middle. Of course, that's different. But at the end of the day, it's really not a massive difference between kicker two and kicker 25. 
You know what I mean? And, and, and then predicting who's going to be two and who's going to be 25 is, is a fool's errand, right? So that's difficult to do. Mm-hmm. I think it's a fair question to say, okay, core special teamers, guys that play on punt coverage, guys that play on you know kick block and all that stuff, are they valuable? Because clearly team builders love those guys. Sure. And it, are they worth spending two or three of your 53 roster spots? Maybe. You know, and I think we all remember, of course, there was a blocked punt for the Packers and all right. all that stuff that, that made a huge impact. But I don't know. I think we're probably overrating the impact of those single plays. And remember also, the league is essentially trying to outlaw the kick return right? Right. As, a, as a play. It's slowly and slowly becoming eradicated completely. And it is like that's one of your elements of special teams. They're trying to get rid of it completely. Um, secondly... Special teams is a lot like the offensive line, where I think it's really a weak link type of deal. It's like your special teams, the difference between an amazing special teams unit and a good special teams unit and a below average special teams unit, there's not really much to it. The only time where it's where it really shows up as a massive deal is where your special teams is so catastrophic that it is costing you Creep back to an average. Right. Creep back to an average there, too. The difference between almost every special teams unit in the NFL last year was negligible, except Green Bay which was so bad, it ended up costing them and, important games. And you could argue that that's the coach, not the players, right? That's not a sure. team-building thing. That's a coach-building thing. And if the coaching is so bad... I mean, look, I would I would maybe invest in a special teams coach just to make sure I'm not getting stuff blocked. Yeah. And then the other element is... And this, this is totally anecdotal, so this might be bullshit. But it feels to me that... The, special, the core special teams players, the guys that are really good at this and you know grade really well in PFF's system now, it feels like they are working their way more onto offense and defense. Like they're not just core special teams players that never feature outside of a punt or a kick. Um, you know, George Odom was the guy that was grading really well for the Colts for a couple of years, and all of a sudden he's getting like significant game time at safety. Uh, Frankie Louvu, another guy who was – graded exceptionally well as a core special teams player. And they say we don't know special teamers. Look at you. But gets on the field, and the dude is like has one of the best grades in the NFL as a linebacker. Okay, he's not playing that much, but he's earning playing time as part of this special teams thing. So it, it feels to me that these guys that maybe in the past would have been pure special teams players that never saw the game otherwise, they actually earn themselves a gig and start getting opportunities because of that. Like remember, like Brendan Ian Badejo, for the Bears years ago was like that dude was the special teams captain was one of the best special teams in the NFL like if he was ever playing on defense something had gone wrong you right know what I mean people had been injured and hurt now it's not the case these guys that are really good special teamers are playing on offense or defense the other thing I would try to consider there there is EPA to be had on special teams right how much is your punter though how much is your kicker so it's not necessarily the the non kickers that are that are making a the biggest impact there the other thing i'll say too right so what to study this further we would have to kind of figure out the difference in epa between the best and worst teams and match that against what else would you do with your roster spots because i've said this before i'm intrigued by like the extra receiver on the team what if you did just have a john ross on your team and you limited his exposure to the football field right and, it, and he's your receiver six but you keep him active enough to just hit a bomb every now and again. It just the EPA of like a bomb to John Ross, right, might be the equivalent of half a year of special teams. I, I don't know. I haven't looked at it closely, but but that's I would rather make an impact with a high impact receiver, depth in the defensive backfield, uh, depth along the offensive line to handle injuries, right? Because like, what's the difference between your starting tackle and your backup tackle? If you if you can invest more in these other positions, are you going to get a better uh, a better payout than what you would get from, say, a core special teams or, team or overtime? And also, I, I happen to think the punters are actually quite valuable. And I might even prioritize getting a punter before a kicker because of what we know about kickers and how random that is over any extended period of time. I just don't think that people that listen to this podcast particularly care to the point where we're going to dedicate an ex, you know, like a period of time discussing punter rankings. Yeah, I I'm mean, sorry if that hits too. You know, if that's that's too honest. Yeah, to answer show. that initial question, and so like when we do Green Bay's uh, fix the fix the Green Bay Packers, yeah. I feel like they already did. I mean, they're getting a new special teams coach, and we talked about that was a big reason they lost that game. Like it's yeah. not like we ignored the special teams element when we were breaking down the game. I just don't think that when we talk about off season, you know, 
rankings. There's yeah, a, when we're, there's yeah. a ton of people interested in my punter breakdown for the free agents. I just, I just don't. And if that's too honest, if I've said the quiet part out loud, I apologize. Oh, we should have just no. I don't. Should have led with that. I don't apologize. That's the truth of the matter. I forget who emails us all the time, but he is a punting there aficionado. Is. I mean, he wants us to do a full show. Yeah. On the punters, right? And I, uh, you know, that's it's probably never going to happen. Niche or niche. Yeah. For uh, for some people, but mm. we're probably not going to get there. Probably not. Maybe if uh, when I'm on vacation, you could do a punter show. Maybe that could be summer. your. Uh, maybe that could be your forfeit. You got to do an hour of punter talk on your own. That would be a funny forfeit. I mean, I'll do some intense punter analysis. You could Bob Ross a punter, like a, a punt spray chart. That would be great. Yeah. That would be awesome. Uh, I'll tell you what else I could do. I can give you 25% off hmm. on uh, any PFF subscription. 25% off. The QB annual is spectacular. It's worth the price of admission. It's live. It just came out Monday. So go check out the QB annual. But you get 25% off using the promo code NFL Pod. Completely undrocked, uh, unlocked mock draft simulator. Yep. You've got the draft guide, which is only 315 pages right now. More to come. All of our free agent rankings, data, grades from the entire 2021 season. It's all a part of Edge and Elite. 25% off using the promo code NFLPOD. So uh, support the podcast. We appreciate it. By giving us 20, you know, and we'll give you 25% off. We do. And we get credit. Not yeah. the other podcast. We get credit for that. But we're trying to, you know, help you out here. 365 days of access. Uh huh. Do you have anything else? No, that's all the emails. Add here. And therefore the show. And we apologize for being late here on YouTube. Yes. Uh, tomorrow we have oh, a very special fault. show. Do we have Austin locked in? Or is he going to be late for that too? I mean, in theory he's locked in, but who he's knows? A, he's a busy man. Austin Gale from Tailgate is going to help us preview the draft. Which you're not listening to this week, but you can listen to after that. What's that? Tailgate. Can't listen. We... You're not allowed oh, to yeah, yeah, yeah. tailgate take a, this week because he just take a one studio. show break from Correct. tailgate. But he'll a be one, on our show. He'll be on our show, so tomorrow. you'll get your you'll get your Austin fix because we're uh, going to talk draft. Tomorrow. It'll be a fast show because he because <laughs> he talks so fast. Yeah. So look, the, the tailgate their their shtick is um, you know young NFL players, rookies, and college players. So who better to talk the draft and all these college players? It, in Austin, I think has interviewed the top 972 prospects. Yeah. From this year's draft. Yeah. He's working through the top 1,000. He's, he's done a ton of interviews. So Austin's going to have incredible insight. He's going to help us kick off draft season. We'll do a little draft overview here tomorrow. Live on YouTube at 1030, as, as long as Austin doesn't make us late again. Mm -hmm. Live on YouTube at 1030 and, of course, wherever you listen to the podcast. Um, and then last, last thing, just to wrap it up, check out the charities. At PFF underscore Sam. Sam has his pinned tweet. Yep. His is for the kids. I have my pinned tweet, at PFF underscore Steve. And we will throw the uh, GoFundMe links into the YouTube description. As YouTube well. description will have both of them. It is a, com is a competition. You can, you can donate to both if you want, but uh, whoever hits their goal first is going to do the forfeit or punishment. Mine being combine drills, mm. which we might replace with some Bob Ross painting. <laughs> And, uh, or soul glow. and you doing some, uh, are you doing one TikTok dance or multiple? I mean, I haven't, I, there's, I haven't done that much research into what a Jackson Mahomes TikTok dance looks like. Do you follow like. ja Jackson Mahomes on Twitter, TikTok? God, no. I, I figure it's like 30 seconds of dance routine. I haven't, like, if it's dramatically yeah. more or less than that, I, we might have to make some adjustments. And if you want to see nipple, get it up to 5,000. I don't know. If one nipple, right. 4,000. Two nipples, 5,000. Because he does the one where he pulls uh, part of his shirt up, of course. <laughs> so that could be the $4,000 stretch goal. I, there's a lot more body hair attached to me than there is Jackson Mahomes. Like his shirtless All thing, right. it's a very uh, We're adjusting very for age hairless. here. We know that you're 39. Yeah. We'll adjust for age. It's a very hairless enterprise, his shirtless. Yeah, TikTok. I mean, he's, he's a kid. Mine wouldn't be. There's a lot more hair involved in that. Sam raising money for Sunshine Kids. Uh, great charity. I'm raising money for Heritage House over here in Cincinnati. So go check out those GoFundMes at our respective Twitter accounts. We appreciate everybody for tuning in. We'll be back here again tomorrow. See you guys.